Hello, I'm Laura Gugumis, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. Our agency's ongoing mule deer research is teaching us a lot about this state icon, but it is also an example of cooperation. Washington State University is maintaining a captive herd of mule deer so that we can make interesting comparisons with their cousins in the wild. And we're looking at captive mule deer and we're trying to find out why the population is declining in the wild by comparing our study with a, a, the wild deer. And we're looking at, the body, today we're looking at the body fat condition and checking for pregnancy rates. And what we're trying to find out is if body conditioning, the level of their body fat is an indicator of if they're going to go into estrus in the season. To be able to do the ultrasounds, what we do is we have a lot of volunteers that come out and help us, and most of them are from the Natural Resource Department, which is where I'm from, and we are, you know, we get 10, 12 people out here. All the volunteers will take the deer, and once we get them drugged, and we will give them vaccines, we'll clip their hooves, we'll just check them just for routine maintenance because it's not all, some of the deer we can go up to but a lot of them that we can't throughout the, you know, the year. So we'll do basic, um, just a look over the animal. Then we take blood samples, one we're looking at leptins to see what type of relationship there is with the leptin and body fat levels and then we'll tie that in to the body fat and conditioning and at the winter time when they go into the estrus cycle. Well, the researchers here at WSU are, are cooperators in the, with, the, uh, with WDFW in the Eastern Washington Cooperative Mule Deer Study. What they're doing here is really important because they're, they're basically our control to, to what we're assessing in terms of body condition of free-ranging mule deer. They're testing deer and assessing body condition and the effects on, on reproductive rates in a controlled situation with animals on, on, on various levels of, of nutrition. We don't have that luxury in the field. They can put these animals on controlled diets, on diets that are similar to what we see in, in mule deer in, out on the open range, and they can put them on diets that are lower in nutrition and in higher in nutrition and, and assess those effects. This provides us with a measure to compare to the deer that we're handling in the field. The state's worst forest fire last year was called the School Fire and damaged thousands of acres of valuable wildlife and fish habitat. WDFW has already started the restoration of this eastern Washington site and the many things to be learned about a forest fire may surprise you. These are our um, most recent project for restoration. Um, Cummings Creek burned very badly. It's also a stream that contains endangered species, uh, salmon and steelhead. So what we're trying to do is restore this area, get some shade back onto the stream, get vegetation growing back in this area. Um, the plants that you can see that have protectors on them, these are aspen. We've also planted red osier dogwood, larch, birch. This, this Cummings Creek drainage is critical winter habitat for elk, and so we're trying to reestablish vegetation for elk, but also just erosion in general. This area was burnt so badly, there is no ground cover anymore to hold soil. And so we're worried about siltation in the creek, which you know also impacts fish, but just general water quality, and also for elk. This area was burnt so hot, I, I don't know. It would probably be 15 or 20 years before we get any sort of overhead cover reestablished. The Umatilla tribe, offered us $15,000, just a donation that was their contribution to restoration after the school fire. And so using that, I went out and bought about 10,000 plants, riparian species mainly. And so we've used those plants. So far we've put in about 700. 
so we only have <laughs> 9,000 some odd more to go. We're trying to reestablish the riparian areas first. Uplands will be planted after the forest logging project has gone through. In a forest normally you will still have some resident woodpeckers that will come in, but after a fire birds react to the the smoke and they will come from miles and miles away and they will start feeding on the bugs that are coming in to attack these dead trees. So right here you'll see feeding marks. This is just the beginning. This is what has happened now through the winter but when spring rolls around, probably May, June, July, you're gonna have birds from all over the countryside coming in to feast on the bugs that will be attacking all of these dead trees. So this is just the beginning. Pretty soon all of these trees will have feeding holes and uh, woodpecker feeding marks on them. There are many species that are fire dependent. Some of these bugs, they can sense heat on their bodies from hundreds of miles away, which seems odd to us, but for them they're sensitized to that. And so they will come to the fire. They can feel the fire, the, the change in temperature, so they're coming. As soon as the, uh, the smoke starts and fills the air, the birds start coming. And so they all react to this and they will come into a fire after, you know, it, it'll take them a few months to actually move into the area and, and attack the bugs, but many of these species don't do well without fire. All of these trees are just going to fall down. It's gonna be jack straw hillsides. And so to, to reduce some of that, they'll take some trees out. We're trying to still leave trees for wildlife use, for, for future snag recruitment, but it also thins the area out and we can come back through and reforest. So some of the money that we make from the forest or from the logging will help us reforest those burnt slopes too. Just offshore and a few feet under the waters of Puget Sound is a world only a diver will experience. We get a close look at one of the state's more interesting wildlife habitats thanks to John Williams, a diver and a Northwest filmmaker. Our guide is Mary Lou Mills from our marine resources program. A peek below the surface of Puget Sound reveals a world of strange looking fish and shellfish, like these two ratfish, close relatives of sharks. These are opalescent squid. The white eggs they have laid are visible on the bottom. Squid with ten tentacles are related to the eight-armed octopus. Lots of species in Puget Sound eat them, including humans. This male and female are locked together in mating. Watch for the squirt of ink as they move away. Puget Sound is home to the largest octopus in the world, the giant Pacific octopus. It grows to 100 pounds or more with an arm spread of over 12 feet. Bay pipefish are related to the seahorse and blend in well with their surroundings. The male carries the eggs in a pouch on his belly until they hatch. Nudibranchs, like this sea lemon, are some of the most interesting animals in Puget Sound. The orange sea pen is an animal also. The white tritonian nudibranch beside it only eats sea pens. Here are two painted greenling. The male, the dark one, is courting the female. The sun star is a fierce predator, kind of like the Siberian tiger of sea stars, or you might say, 
Darth Vader of the Deep. This decorator crab is doing an excellent job of looking like a piece of debris wafting with the current. Moving from these deep water Darth Vaders to the sun above looks like a short distance. This underwater world is just a few yards from the shoreline of Puget Sound. It is some of the most unique habitat in Washington and quite possibly the entire world. Here are some of the places where you can see Washington's wildlife in the coming weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can save Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching.